Hey, good morning everyone on the online uh, campus. Great to have you with us today. We're going to talk to you about uh, assurance again today. Things you can know. Things I want you to know. Last week we talked about assurance of salvation. 1 John 5, 11 and 12. And this is a testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. He who has a Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Another great verse to memorize, a little bit shorter and easier to memorize, is 1 John 1, 12. 9. And 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just or righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We're talking about forgiveness today. Everyone needs forgiveness. All kinds of stuff out there about how that uh, forgiveness is such a healing, emotional thing for people. Not only for the person who receives it, for the, but for the person who gives it. And the Bible has a whole lot to say about forgiveness. Jesus taught us to pray, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And later on he says, you know, in the manner you forgive other people the way God's going to forgive you. So I think we understand, I need to learn forgiveness from God so I can give forgiveness to others. Assurance of forgiveness. Knowing Forgiveness. Do you know you're forgiven and do you know how to forgive? So in our passage today, we have a couple of verses uh, that, that talks about not calling God a liar. And, uh, and, and, and so I want to look at that. There's two basic lies that are dealt with in this passage. One of them is the idea that being forgiven is just a, it's a blanket over everything I do it. Do it. Now, sometimes we use the phrase it's kind of half truth. It has some truth to it. Um, Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. And you may find one, like to put on your front of your car if you have like only license plates in the back of your car, unlike New York State, of course. But you know, down south, I didn't have a plate in the front so I could leave on whatever I wanted. So you could put like this, Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. And that might help make up for the way you're driving. People say, okay, well, yeah, you're a Christian and you drive like that, but you're forgiven, even though you probably should take driving lessons. You see, because our behavior does speak louder sometimes than our words. We can use forgiveness as an excuse to some degree, but not according to God's words. Because God says you cannot say, hey, I am, I believe in Jesus and all that without having a transformation. In fact, it says in this passage, it says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So forgiveness, that cleansing is tied to my behavior in response to God's forgiveness. A lot of times we never even try though to do good until we are forgiven. I know a lot of us like to be forgiven. Forgiveness was built into the Old Testament culture. They would forgive everyone's debts every 50 years. Wouldn't you love that, wouldn't you? And if you did though, wouldn't you start from fresh and think differently about things? See the idea of you've been forgiven, you should forgive others, should be built right into the very nature of being a Christian. So look at the passage here. Being a Christian does not mean that I can do whatever I want because I'm forgiven. No matter how I live, I'm still forgiven type of attitude. That's Christians aren't, aren't perfect, just forgiven. Righteousness is, is imputed upon us, a big word in, in theology, right? When we come to Christ, we ask him to forgive us our sins because our sins are separate from God. He forgives us. He gives us Christ's righteousness. It's called imputed, put upon us. But more than that, because uh, Wesley went on to talk about the idea of being in party. See, Jesus Christ imputes righteousness upon us, and he credits the Christian with his righteousness, all right? And it's like he's like our co-signer, so to speak, enabling the Christian to be justified, okay? Now, imparted means that the righteousness which God does in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit is put inside us with his justification, and it works out of us, so we're working out our salvation, so to speak, as Paul says, the fear of So working in the Christian to enable and empower the process of sanctification, making us holy. That's how we look at it as Wesleyans. We don't want to sell God short what he wants to do through us. So forgiveness is, is part of this whole process of receiving God's uh, imputed righteousness and imparted righteousness into us. And so therefore, the way I grow is directly tied to how I receive and understand his complete forgiveness and how I share it with others. There's another sort of lie here that I think comes out of this passage and you know, you've heard that, that saying that, you know, uh, love means never having to say you're sorry. And you're probably thinking right now, no, it should say something else. Go ahead and type it in the bottom. You think it really should say. If you really love someone, you probably have to say sorry a lot because 
living together with people and people you love with, uh, and you're close, you're going to do things that hurt them, even if you don't intend to. And you might want to say sorry. In fact, this is what Christianity really is like. It's not like we never have anything to apologize for. See, here's the other side of it. There's, there's like two sides of this coin. Some people go so far one way to think that because God forgives me, I can do whatever I want. The other side is because God forgives me, I am made holy and I don't have anything to apologize for ever again. And that's wrong too. Why did Jesus tell his disciples to pray, forgive us our trespasses? Because he knew they'd have to pray that because there's a lot to confess. As you grow, you, you have more to confess than less. You see, we should confess more when we are aware of the holiness of God. Uh, I love that the passage in Isaiah 6, when it says that Isaiah, who was a, a priest and a holy man, he sees a vision of God, he said, woe was me. And he begins to confess his sins. I am undone from a man of unclean lips. And I dwell among a people of unclean lips. And he recognized his need to be forgiven and cleansed of sin. You see, the more we walk with holy God, the more we want to confess. So confession is a way of life for a Christian. I confess the point of salvation. I can continue to confess that he is holy and I'm not. And I grow through this confession. And forgiveness is an active thing that happens in me and through me and for others as well as for me. So I want to know what this confession is that brings forgiveness of sin, uh, that gets me into, this, into the family of God as well as keeps me in a good relationship with God as I grow and with other people. See, true confession brings forgiveness. And forgiveness is not just an action act, it is an action. It happens throughout our walk with Jesus Christ. True confession brings forgiveness. See, we're, we're told when we have communion, and we do this once a week in our early service and make it optional, of course. But we're told that when we have communion, we should come before God and we should make our confession. And the early church had communion as often as they ever met. And so that's why we do it more often than not. So we're told to make our confession. If we as Christians would confess more, perhaps we see more power and more change in our lives world. The early church did it all the time and they turned their world upside down. I'm talking about the fathers of our church, the people who wrote the books of the Bible they confessed on a regular basis as they had communion. You see, when I confess, what does confession mean? It's It means more sometimes than perhaps what we're talking about. Confess means first of all, to publicly declare. Now Romans 10 uh, nine, and we use this verse last week, says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So that is a declaration of my intent. You know, like a declaration of intent is part of a wedding ceremony. I intend to live with this person for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, for sickness and health, and the death of his part. That's a declaration of intent. And oftentimes you watch directors get progressing through this wedding ceremony say, I will. And then when you ask them all the questions, they say, I do. And then the minister says, you are married. That progression through the ceremony. See, but this idea of declaration of intent, see, of intent. see the word in the Greek for confession, it means to agree. It means to speak the same to confess. When you get married, you're speaking the same, your vows, you're agreeing together, you're making a confession. So to publicly declare something is part of what confession is. It also means to admit uh, when you confess your sins, it says to admit your sins. But confession of the idea of declare is first of all to confess Jesus as Lord. In fact, it says that uh, it's to confess the Lordship of Christ. It's to declare, intend to obey him. The Bible says here, this passage here, verse, verse 5 and 6 of, of 1 John says, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. <laughs> God is light. It's clear. Light and darkness are big difference, are they not? So God is like, see, God is like, is the, the act of confession is saying, I'm making a confession that I want to walk with him. And it says, if you walk in that light as he is in the light, that's where you have this cleansing going on. So my confession is part of my life. It's not just a, a, a one-time event or a statement. It's how I live. It's a, de a declaration followed by an action. The answer to the lie that Christians aren't perfect 
just forgive them is they are forgiven as they walk and they continue to walk in forgiveness. Therefore, they walk in the light as he is in the light. They follow his example. They are learning to be like him. When they stumble and fall, they confess their sins and he forgives them. There's another verse that talks about this idea of walking. It says in, in Romans chapter eight, it says, there's that for now no condemnation, the same idea of being cleansed from your sin, all right? Uh, to those who are in Christ Jesus, you're in Christ Jesus, you're walking, who do not walk according to the flesh, the things you always want to do, but according to the spirit, Romans 8, 1. So this idea of walking with God is part of this whole declaration of confession. If anyone says, I know him, it says in, in chapter two of first John, verse four, says, if anyone says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, that's an idea. Again, walking with God, he is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So we're trying to spell the lies of what true repentance and confession of sin is all about. It is a declaration of a life following Jesus. So my declaration of, of to obey Jesus involves walking in the light, being in fellowship with other believers. I have to be forgiving to do that and being forgiven and cleansed from sin. That is a holy life, walking in forgiveness and in holiness. The second thing about this confession is, not as a declaration, is to admit something, all right? So if I come to you with confession, I'm admitting something. Like, I admit I'm the one that ate the last cookie, okay? I am the one that ate the last cookie over in the office, in case you're wondering. I admit that, okay? So it's admit. So we, so admitting our sins is what brings forgiveness. And so the verse of scripture we read here earlier in verse eight says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's just admitting your sin. Now it's not admitting someone else's sins, it's admitting your sins. That's what confession is. The life of confession is constantly saying, Lord, I have sinned. And you have in comparison to God, if we're really honest, and you say, no, I haven't ever sinned, it's not me, it's someone else's fault, the Bible says you're calling God a liar because our comparison is to a holy God. So to admit is important here. And admitting our sins brings forgiveness. Just admit your sins to bring forgiveness. Uh, to, it means confess, to admit your sins. We do have to say I'm sorry as Christians from time to time. We're not to be so high and mighty that we will achieve so much in our maturity. We never have to forget, be forgiven because we're so holy. We will find the more we're like God, the more closer we get to God, the more we are not like him. And we need to grow and be admitting our need to grow. Because until you're dead, you haven't been perfected completely. Now, God can do a great work in your heart. And that's a whole different message, I suppose. How he changed us in our desire and our motives inside us and a, and a miraculous work inside of us. And so we can live victoriously. But the key to living victoriously is to live in the spirit of confession with God. So admitting your sins brings forgiveness. We live as forgiven saints. We live as holy people because we are humble before God all the time. There's no room for arrogance in the holy life. Admitting our sins brings forgiveness. Listen, it says, it says if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. I mentioned that already. And we, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Here's the thing. For this passage, we find that admitting our sins brings forgiveness. So don't be deceived by self-righteousness, first of all. Secondly, admit you're wrong. Go ahead and confess. And his word reveals our sinfulness. If you're in the word of God, it is constantly, uh, it's, it's cutting down deep between your, in your being and dividing asunder, it says in the King James, you know, uh, and it, how it, it can cut and divide the soul and the spirit and get into the real truth of the matter. And you find more and more things to learn, more and more things where we need to confess to be like him. And so the word will reveal sinfulness in us. And if you say, no, there's no sin in me, then you're calling the word a liar because the word is him. It's his presence right there with you, talking with you and being honest with you. And we can't hide when we're in the presence of God. So those three things, don't be deceived, admit wrong. His word reveals our sinfulness because if we don't see any sin in our life when we're around the presence of God, then the word is not in us, it says 
in this passage. So what is Christ's role as we confess our sin? What is he doing for us? Because it's neat what it says here in chapter, chapter 2. It says, my little children, I am writing to you that you may not sin. Uh, but if we, anyone does sin, we have an advocate with him, the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is a propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. First John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Now look at this passage here, because it gives you a couple words here. But um, it's saying, I'm not writing you, it says, I'm writing that you may not sin. It's interesting because it's almost as saying, you know, the purpose of li living and, and confessing our sins is not so we become habitual sinners just saved. No, we are to, we're working so we do not sin. We're working out of sinfulness to righteousness. And so the goal is righteousness. So sometimes people take that idea of Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven, and make excuse for their sinning. There's never excuse for sin before a holy God. But we want to recognize what he is doing on our behalf when we, as soon as we know we've done wrong, we say, I'm sorry, Lord, and we confess it. That's that walking in humility with God and with one another. First of all, Jesus is our advocate, it says. He is the one who pleads our case. He is our lawyer, so to speak, right? An advocate is one who, um, who makes the right judgment call because he's close enough to the situation. He knows all the things we've been dealt with. He was tempted everywhere we are, but he did not sin. So he pleads our case and he recognizes us to the Father. Okay, now the second thing it says is he's a propitiation for the sins. He's the atoning sacrifice. That's a big word, propitiation, right? The atoning sacrifice. Can you say that? See, you say that out loud. Propitiation. You think I'm having a hard time. You try it now, right? But he's or the atoning sacrifice. Well, that means he took those who were separated from, from God and when he died on the cross and shed his blood, he atoned them at one that he brought them to God. That's how his sacrificial work brings them to God. We talked about last week the idea of the sacrificial lamb and how we confess our sins and they're, they're put upon him. So the, I, he is the one. He is that lamb. He is that one for all the world. But for those who are believers already, he is the advocate. See, he, he is an offer of salvation for everyone. But once we are saved, it's different. He pleads our case. It's kind of like this. When you're born into the body of Christ, you're born into the family, you are now a child of God. Now, well, before you're a child of God, you need a bit more grace. The atoning sacrifice of blood of Jesus to bring you to the family. When you're in the family, it's more like, well, this is our child. We're going to give him, we want to be more patient with him. You, you know how it is. You're at Walmart and someone's kids acting like a brat. They're a brat. But it's your kid. You you make excuses for them or you make allowances for them as an advocate. You say, well, they're tired. They're hungry. Whatever. Because you love them. They're part of your family. You understand them. You're closer to them. You can be an advocate for them. Same thing with Jesus. He's both the advocate and the propitiation of sins for the whole world. Now, Here's what I want you to know today. More than else, I want you to know you are saved, right? First John 5, 11 and 12, same book we're reading from today. And this is the testament that God has given us eternal life. And he who has a son, has been received him, right? Who has, who has a son, has life. Who does not have the son of God, does not have life. First John 5, 11 and 12, assurance of salvation. But I also want you to know you're forgiven. If you confess your sins, admit your sins, and declare the Lordship of Jesus Christ, you will be cleansed and forgiven. If you confess your sins, first John 1, 9, uh, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, assurance of forgiveness, first John 1, 9. And you need to know how to forgive them because listen, if bitterness is in your life, it's an indication of an unforgiven heart. We need to get rid of all bitterness. Scripture tells us time and time again, it's the way to know, have I received the forgiveness of God? Because if I have, I will share with others that's what we need to know, the forgiveness of God, so I can forgive others. This world needs people to model forgiveness for them. I don't know who you need to forgive right now. Maybe you need to forgive that, that friend or family member that voted different than you during the election. You need to forgive them. Maybe you need to forgive that other party and all those people out there you think are so evil. You need to forgive them in order for God to forgive you. Can you do that? If you can't, you need to go back to Jesus and see how much he paid for your soul by dying on the cross as a atoning sacrifice. See, what the world needs now is a church that's better at confession than it is at condemnation. It needs a church that knows forgiveness 
and speaks forgiveness and practices forgiveness among the body. First of all, the people need to look at the church and say, hey, you know what? Maybe they, they don't agree on all this stuff, but you know what? They really are forgiving and compassionate towards one another. They're merciful. We need that to be in the church. And we as Christians need to model forgiveness to this world among one another, first of all, and then also to the world. As Jesus wants to forgive the world, he came to because he loved the world. For God so loved the world, he gave his only back. And whosoever believes in him shall not perish, have everlasting life. There's no limitation of their background or how they voted, by the way. He wants everyone saved. We as Christians are appealing to you, and I am appealing to you as Christians, to build the kingdom, make our uni unifying force be that of the kingdom of God above all the stuff around us because we, we know that Jesus was there before, he'll be there again. But we need to make sure we exercise forgiveness in the body of Christ. The world needs to see that in the church. Do you know Jesus in that way? Where well, he's forgiven you in such a way that nothing is done against you cannot be forgiven. That's a challenge. But I believe the power to forgive is found in the willingness to receive forgiveness from Jesus Christ. Let me just tell you right now, whatever you've committed, what sin you've committed, however bad it is, maybe it's caused you to feel extreme guilt and condemnation, I want to let you know that Jesus is waiting to forgive you. We forgive you as a church. Church, whatever it is you have a hard time forgiving someone for, let the forgiveness of Jesus flow through you to them and receive the joy of God. By forgiving. May God bless you today as you learn to know forgiveness. Feel free to message me for more questions about this. I'd love to help you if I can. May God bless you. Have a great day. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, forgive us for our sins as we forgive others. And thank you that by just saying that, you have forgiven us. And through the power of our receiving forgiveness, help us to forgive others. Remove all bitterness from us. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope you know you're saved. And I hope you know you're forgiven because you've prayed that prayer. God bless you. Have a great day.